Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Colloquium. This is Kardec Iyer. He is a Hubble Fellow at Columbia University. Um, previous to that, he got his uh, he got his PhD at Rutgers, uh, where he developed this really, really innovative way of inferring the properties, the, the formation histories of galaxies based on um, something called the dense basis method, which he's going to talk about today, which really is the thing that got him into astrostatistics and machine learning. Uh, Kardec is really at the intersection of the physics of galaxy formation, astrostatistics, and machine learning. So he has a really unique perspective on how we can get better information from our quite limited observations. Is that? Is that me making a weird noise? Oh, sweet. I was like, am I whistling? And I don't know. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I'm really excited to see this talk today, as I think are a lot of our younger scientists who are really interested to understand how we can, uh, in a sophisticated way, incorporate machine learning in our understanding of astrophysics. Um, so everyone, please welcome Kardec. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. Uh, and I'm really, really happy to be here and talk to everyone. Uh, before that, is the mic okay? Do I need to talk louder or anything? Okay, great. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here today. My name is Kadri Kayar. I uh, basically am a methods person in the sense that while I really, really care about how galaxies form, and all the interesting stuff that we can do with them. The fact of the matter is that our data used to look like this at one point of time. And as we get better telescopes, our data started looking like this. And as we get telescopes that look at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we started augmenting that with multiple wavelengths and getting more information. And with the next generation of telescopes, we might get even better. So things that right now our artist impressions might actually be images that you see. Uh, JWST has already been doing this. And so what I want to do is make sure that you can get the maximum science out of these incredible data. Right. Okay, so before I go anywhere science words, I first have to thank this huge network of collaborators, which is the main reason I'm in the field, which is the main reason I enjoy doing the work. And I am very, very grateful to all the kind people who have given me guidance and support during not only uh, my PhD, but during the dark times of the pandemic. So without them, I wouldn't be here right now. I'm also extremely grateful for all the incredible students that I get to work with and people who develop and maintain open source software because so many of us use that in our research so it's important to acknowledge the amount of time and energy that goes into both developing and maintaining these things all right so uh, before i jump in why do i do what do i do and uh, Part of it is you see the dotted line going up, and this is part of the reason I'm in astrophysics and I do what I do. But also because I think about these six questions. So primarily, I'm interested in what makes galaxies form stars and eventually sometimes stop forming stars. Uh, many of you here are not galaxies people, and that's fully OK, because I hope that one of the other questions here will be of interest to you. and essentially provide a bridge for you to care about like the stuff that I'm showing today. Uh, the second question is, as our data gets better, but also as our data gets larger and messier, how do these noisy ensembles of measurements give us usable science? Uh, before coming to astronomy, I used to work in, in essentially string theory. And there wasn't as much of a focus in science communication. One of the really nice things I like about this community is how much we think about how to explain to other people what we are doing and why it matters. So I end up thinking a lot about how we can communicate science to others and how we can communicate science better to our students, especially. And finally, like Erica said, I straddle the field of astronomy, but also astrostatistics and machine learning. And that field has made insane leaps in the last few years. And it's, it feels exponential to someone who's looking at the literature literally like double in quantity every year. So 
I'm thinking a lot about how we can do astrophysics with the large data sets that's going to come out of future telescopes and how AI and ML will influence not only the, the science that we do, but like the meta science, the environment that we live in, right? So, okay, perfect. So this basically translates into science and method development, teaching, mentoring, and outreach, and machine learning, high performance computing, and broader impacts. So because this colloquium is going to be very limited, I just wanted to put up a slide saying, you can come talk to me about a whole bunch of different things. If galaxy evolution based stuff is interesting, definitely bug me about that. If you want to talk about science communication or mentoring, uh, talk to me about that. If you want to talk about astrostatistics and machine learning, I will go over some of the things on the side during my talk today, but it's going to be in the context of galaxy problems. So if you want to talk about how that applies to what you're doing or consider extensions, then definitely ask me about that later. All right, that out of the way, galaxies. So why do we study galaxies? There's two parts to this answer. Part one is because we can. And the reason we can see galaxies is because the telescopes that we use are incredibly powerful and essentially look at objects uh, whose light has been traveling for billions of years to reach us and actually collect that in a meaningful way and resolve it and show us these things. So we can see objects that uh, as they were billions of years ago, and we can see objects as they were a few light years ago, and we can use this to essentially chart how objects evolve over time. And people can do this with many things. Some people do this with black holes, some people do this with gravitational waves, some people do this with protoplanetary disks. I like to do it with galaxies because it has one of the largest dynamic ranges in terms of what we can see. And so you can actually see galaxies across an incredible array of cosmic epochs, and you can try to figure out how they're evolving. So essentially, like as you see things from the Big Bang, from once the dark ages were over, the first stars formed, they reionized the universe, for the first galaxies formed soon after that. And this is essentially something that we are pushing the frontiers of right now. So it's really interesting times to live in as well. So I'm sure that like, it's a product of the time that I live in that I have access to these incredible people and incredible facilities that allow me to do this. The nice thing is when we look at a whole bunch of galaxies, we can essentially conduct a census. So if you consider stars as individual people, because stars are extremely complex. We don't fully understand their atmospheres. We don't fully understand their evolution, though we know a lot about them. You can think of galaxies as the cities these people live in. So I have a question for you in that, how many types of cities exist? Right, any? As many cities as there are. Exactly. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can still try to make trends. You can talk about, large cities versus small cities, you can talk about dense versus rare cities, you can talk about uh, cities that have an increasing GDP versus ones that don't. And that's sort of what we do with galaxy surveys. We look at these cities that the stars live in, and we try to categorize them because categorization is something that comes very naturally to, to most people. So we look at the morphology and we say, oh, that's a spiral, that's an elliptical, that's an irregular. We look at whether they are forming stars or whether they're quiescent, they're not forming stars anymore. We look at whether they're uh, old or young or whether they stopped forming stars for a while in between and then started up again. These are called rejuvenated galaxies. And we make a whole bunch of other divisions based on physical properties, like how many heavy elements they have, whether or not they have supermassive black holes and what that's doing to the galaxy. Or we look at special characteristics, populations, that were either found through citizen science projects like green pea galaxies or uh, things that look ultra compact or ultra diffuse or have some kind of defining characteristic to them but the really interesting thing is that basically any property that we choose to study galaxies in they show an incredible amount of diversity because the number of things that makes up these galaxies are manifold and that brings us to the first question, which is how do we explain this incredible diversity that we see in galaxy populations? So in terms of the city analogy, you can talk about whether or not it's near a water body, whether or not 
uh, it's increasing in population, whether or not uh, geopolitical conditions are conducive to people living there or not. And you can start doing similar things with galaxies and there's almost as many factors to think of. So that's part two of 10, I think, which is <laughs> that we can, we can't really do experiments the way we do in physics with our universe because we just have the one universe and we can't really perturb it and see what changes. But we can build computer simulations of galaxies and of how the universe evolves with all the physics that we know of so far. And so we can put all of that in. So we can consider galaxies to be these gravitationally bound cluster collections of stars, gas, dark matter. And then you can say, okay, so if I care about star formation, about whether these galaxies are able to form stars or not, it's regulated by a whole bunch of different physics. So cold dense gas falls in, collapses under gravity, forms stars. These stars explode and release winds. And that can perturb the gas in the rest of the galaxy and determine whether or not it can cool and collapse under gravity. You can have the formation of things like spiral arms or galactic bulges where gas gets selectively funneled into specific parts of the galaxy and is or is not allowed to cool and form stars. You can talk about things that happen externally where another galaxy comes and merges with one, which sort of felt like uh, Denver and Boulder when I first came in. Uh, and essentially when galaxies interact with each other, what happens? You can talk about the central supermassive black holes that a lot of galaxies host which put out incredible amounts of energy as they accrete gas. And this can disrupt star formation. Sometimes it can even regulate star formation. And you can talk about inflows of pristine gas from the galactic environment, from the halo that it lives in and maybe even beyond. Finally, you can talk about things that go boom in galaxies and yeet gas out. And sometimes some of that gas actually slows down and falls back in. And so we take all of these different physical pro processes and we can model them. We can make computer simulations that have magnetohydrodynamics and uh, essentially like track all the chemical evolution, track how galaxy properties evolve over time. But then the question remains, how do we link all of these physics to the things that we actually observe, right? So that's question two. So I think part three is trying to bring those two questions together to create an observable basis in which we can answer these things. So the thing we can observe for most galaxies with relatively less, well, okay. A, a spectrum of a galaxy is a measure of its flux as a function of wavelength. This is basically looking at how bright a galaxy is at different wavelengths. The reason this is interesting is because galaxies look different at different wavelengths. And so, looking at galaxies across a bunch of wavelengths is what gives us information about what's going on in them, what their stellar populations are, what its chemical composition is, and so forth. The way we study galaxies is often through a mixture of spectroscopy, which is getting essentially using a grating to get a, a, a spectrum of like one small range in the electromagnetic spectrum for how a galaxy looks or photometry, which are these broadband filters that you can use in front of a camera to get all the light in a specific wavelength range. And so this is what we use to connect the physics of what's going on in a galaxy or like the physical properties of a galaxy at the time we observe it to observations that we can perform with our telescopes. And it would be easy if a spectrum was just one thing. So this is just the spectrum from the stellar continuum for a single galaxy. But then when the galaxy is actively forming stars, you have these essentially nebulae of hot gas that these new stars are born in and that causes atomic transitions that result in nebular emission lines. There's a lot of dust that essentially looks like uh, the exhaust from your car really. Uh, that these uh, photons have to pass through. And so a lot of the higher energy photons get absorbed by that and then sometimes re-radiated in the infrared. So that's the re-radiated part. And then you have these active galactic nuclei that can contribute both uh, 
emission lines, but also this dusty torus emission. Uh, and so essentially what you see as the spectrum of a galaxy is actually the mix of many different things. And it's important to properly disentangle all of those things if you want to actually understand what's going on in a galaxy. And just going back to that stellar continuum part, the reason I care particularly about the spectrum as opposed to maybe other traces is because uh, just following the laws of black body radiation, stars of different uh, temperatures peak at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and stellar lifetimes correlate with their temperatures. So you can essentially use uh, the spectrum to disentangle the stellar populations uh, of a galaxy. So you can try to figure out uh, how many different like the number of, of different stellar populations that you have in a galaxy. And so all of this brings us back to the physics. So we have a way to get at populations of different ages. And on the other hand, in our simulations, we have all of these different physical processes that act on many different characteristic time scales. So the basic theory of what I'm trying to do is constrain the relative strength of each of these processes in a given galaxy population using a set of spectral observables. So these are actually too many to go into detail, but a single example is that of galaxy quenching. So we know that galaxies sometimes stop forming stars, but then you can think about why they stop forming stars and it could be a variety of reasons, but basically it's things that either heat up the gas in a galaxy and stop it from collapsing or that expel the gas from a galaxy and stop it from falling back in and cooling and forming stars. And so because the things that cause these things to happen uh, can act on a range of characteristic time scales, if you can estimate the time scale on which a given population of galaxies quench, you can tie that to the physics of what's causing them to quench. Right? So that's, that's roughly the, the workflow. So coming back to this plot, you can again divide it into so in physics, we love doing effective things, whether it's quantum field theory or this, you essentially say, okay, effectively there are three time scales that we can try to constrain. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to stick to short, intermediate and long, and they encapsulate different classes of different of physical processes. And the reason we are able to do this with spectra is because the spectra have these different spectral features. So H alpha is just emission from the Balmer transition. Uh, UV is basically radiation from very bright young stars. So essentially these spectral features uh, trace different stellar populations. And so they are sensitive on different parts of this time scale plot. And so you can essentially use the strength of emission in these different spectral features to break these indices and get an estimate of how stars formed over time in a galaxy. Okay. so. The thing we want to get at is this, it's the star formation history of a galaxy, which is a record of how galaxies form stars over time. And this tends to have signatures from many different physical processes that happen. So when mergers happen, it could either elevate or suppress star formation sharply. Uh, smooth accretion does things, AGN feedback does other things. So we want to get at this and get overall trends of how the star formation history looks and tie that to physics. And the reason this is important is because galaxies that tend to look different also tend to have very different star formation history. So a lot of people study galaxies in morphology, and this is a complementary view to that. And it also provides a common reference point between what we can get from the observations and what we can produce using our simulations. So it provides a baseline that we can use to make comparisons. All right, so to sum up everything so far, with star formation histories, we can observe how individual galaxies evolve over time. We can bridge gaps between populations of galaxies that, uh, that exist at different epochs. And we can link observable phenomena to physical processes. Uh, any questions or anything so far, or is this fairly okay? Okay, great. So because there exist many methods of doing this that some of which I'll go into, uh, I just want to advertise this thing called the dense basis method that I develop and maintain that essentially takes uh, these multi-wavelength spectra of galaxies and tries to get at the star formation history as robustly as possible 
It's uh, public, coded in Python, available in some other SED fit encodes as well, and fully documented. So if you want to use it, come talk to me. All right, so that's what, that's what I wanted to do. And I was going more into the simulations to try to figure out like what's the physics and what's going on. And then JWST launched and completely upended my plans for what I wanted to do. And part of it is because uh, there was a part of my brain that didn't want to believe that it will actually happen because it was so primed for failure in my head where I was like, I will avoid disappointment by not banking anything on this. But also because it did so well, it like the first images that came out of JWST just blew everyone's mind. We were just left wondering how we can see so much structure, how we can uh, like, so for reference, uh, Janskis are a unit of flux density that I work with. And I used to do observations with the Hubble telescope, which had uh, un like galaxies that we would observe in the micro Jansky range. And then with web, we could see things in the nano Jansky range. And it's insane. Like the, the scope of what we could do suddenly dramatically increased. So uh, this was the, the canonical plot that I'm required to show contractually for what web is able to do, but it essentially peers back further in time than we have ever been able to. It sees objects that are fainter, objects that are uh, more resolved than we could do with uh, previous telescopes. And this essentially brought a whole bunch of these single object results uh, into the fore, things that were these incredible right out of the gate discoveries of what galaxies look like and what they're doing at epochs and brightnesses that we could not observe before. So in particular, one that I want to show is this thing called the Sparkler Galaxy that a collaborator, Lamia Mola, who's now at Wellesley, oh, I should update the slide, and uh, I looked at. So basically, this is the very first picture that JWST took. Uh, and in, oops, yeah, in here, we, we noticed like this uh, multiply imaged object, so an object that was strongly gravitationally lensed and had three images. And one of them, the center one, is magnified almost by a factor of 100, we think. And so when we looked at that, with Hubble, it looks pretty unresolved. And then with JWST, you see this incredible structure that pops out. And you have all of these like tiny knots that seem to be surrounding the galaxy. And that's just not something we thought with Hubble. Most people, like papers had been written on this thinking that it's an edge on disk galaxy. So, and that it has a gravitational magnification of like 10. So seeing this was incredible. And then we went in and we got histories for these objects and turns out that some of them formed extremely early uh, after the Big Bang, which makes us think that these could actually be globular clusters or something. Uh, so gravitationally lensed globular clusters with JWST was a use case that no one had thought of. And so seeing this essentially like opens up an entire subfield of what you can do. So it makes it easy to see why I can get sidetracked by the kind of results that we're seeing. That said, there are many challenges in the JWST era. So the first is that in the first year of public observations, we have already collected uh, spectra or like coarse spectra for about a million galaxies. And so analyzing them is going to be a real effort. A lot of our algorithms take a lot of time to process each galaxy. So we want things that are fast and that can scale even faster for when we get more data. So here we have been looking at solutions using something called amortized computation, which is where you front load a lot of the computational work so that the actual algorithm has to do less processing or emulators that Erica and collaborators work on where you essentially train a neural network to do the thing that your more uh, computationally expensive algorithm is otherwise doing, or something called SBI, which stands for simulation based inference, where you essentially train an inference algorithm using many simulations to do a thing faster. The second thing is the fact that as we go to places that we don't have knowledge of, right, like in terms of the highest redshifts or the lowest masses, these objects that we haven't seen before, we come in with some physical information of what we think these objects might look like and how they might have formed. And so we need to think about whether we want to be fully uninformative 
and then be biased by fitting algorithms or whether we want to incorporate biases that come from physical information we know into our fitting. So there's a lot of Bayesian methods here, especially ones that use coverage tests, where you essentially make a prediction and check it against an expected result and use that to calibrate. And there's a way of doing this that's not circular. So otherwise you're double dipping. And so there's a lot of really interesting statistics that goes into that. Or making full forward models. So use a simulation and then use everything you know about physics and radiator transfer to go all the way to the observational space. And then the third question is when you have uh, all of this pristine data, you also have a bunch of low signal to noise junky data that comes along with it. And personally, that's the part of the data that I find most interesting. So I think a lot about how you can maximize the amount of information that you can get out of a given data set. And this comes from something called non-parametric methods where you essentially like allow the number of parameters in your model to be free and informed by the quality of the data that you're working with. So you can again use statistical tests to determine when you hit that threshold of like, oh, I can do this much, but not better. And use that to essentially inform the data quality of whatever models you're working with. In addition to this new data, that we have seen with JWST brings with it new puzzles. So Erica and her collaborators have been involved in the discovery of these extremely massive high redshift galaxies that uh, were called, what, is it hashtag universe breakers? That I just love. Uh, but essentially galaxies that seem to have formed a lot of stellar mass at very high redshifts and explaining them is a challenge. Some of these galaxies also tend to have supermassive black holes that are also very massive and explaining that has also been a challenge. Then there's all of these questions of uh, essentially do stars blowing up uh, have the same effect on galaxies at high redshift that they do now because the conditions back then were very different. The universe was much hotter, much denser. So we expect that uh, the way feedback works is also quite different. So there's new scientific questions as well that we are trying to answer with these data. And, huh, interesting. I've never seen this before. Okay, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know which part didn't load, but I guess we'll never find out. Okay, so that's, that's where JWST sort of sidetracked me. And part of what I want to talk about now is that third point about inferring the maximum amount of information that you can. So this is just one example using something called Gaussian processes. Gaussian processes are really cool, by the way. So if you want to talk about that, I am happy to like just chuck this talk and do my Gaussian process talk, but maybe later. So we start out with this question of how we model individual galaxies. And for the longest time when we had uh, poor data quality, we would model it using these extremely simple forms of like constant star formation or exponentially declining star formation or these linear rise exponentially declining models. But as we get better data, it's been shown that these simple parametric forms tend to uh, miss out on a lot of the older stellar mass and bias our estimates of the stellar mass, the star formation rate, and all of these like derived galaxy properties. So people have been looking at slightly more sophisticated ways of modeling star formation histories. One is to use better parametric forms, things that have more flexibility and maybe can capture more of the shapes. Uh, maybe simulations can directly provide us with a basis of realistic star formation histories that we can use. Uh, or you can divide time into bins and then just find the star formation rate in each bin. And then there's this last one that I've been sort of working on because I care about time scales and I wanted to come up with a star formation history method that can actually get at these time scales robustly. So there's good points and bad points about all of these methods. And a lot of times it depends on the exact science question that you're asking. And so these bin time scales can give you a lot of information, especially about robust galaxy properties like stellar masses and star formation rates. And in general, if you have the option, if you talk to anyone who does galaxy stuff, tell them to use non-parametric star formation histories because they make life much better. <laughs> but also, uh, the bins don't allow you to get the smooth time scale, such as like the amount of time it takes for that sharp starburst to decline or the, the subsequent behavior. 
So I've been trying to come up with something like this that essentially encodes a lot more of the overall shape of the star formation history without needing too many extra parameters. And so the way I'm doing it is essentially instead of th thinking of bins in time, I'm thinking of bins in stellar mass. So you can say I'm dividing the stellar mass into equal quantiles and trying to figure out when it formed the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter of its mass and trying to constrain those from the observations instead. And the reason this works, even though these are integral constraints, right? Like you have to integrate the star formation history from zero to T25 to get the first quarter of mass is because you can use these really nice ways of dealing with time series to model these integral constraints. So I model the star formation history as a Gaussian process. And if you've never heard of a Gaussian process, it's really just two things that you might have heard of, a Gaussian, which everyone here knows, I hope, and a process, which is something like Brownian motion, where it's just some variable being tracked over time. So a Gaussian process is fully characterized by a mean and a covariance. It's a mean at every point in time, and a covariance which says, if I have a star formation rate or some other variable at time t and t prime, this is how they're related to each other. So this one's showing a very simple mean, it's a uniform prior, and a simple covariance function where if you're close to each other in time, you are correlated, and if you're far away, you're not correlated. This is something we see in many physical systems. Uh, this one's taken from that for a damped random walk, and essentially draws from this Gaussian process give you smooth curves like that. So when you condition this on actual data, the covariance function essentially collapses depending on what constraints you have from your data and gives you the smooth curve with uncertainties. So the nice part about this is also that because there are uncertainties, it all folds very naturally into the kind of noisy data that we have to deal with. So if your data is uncertain, you'll just get larger uncertainties. Okay, so mean and covariance. Expanded, it looks something like this. You don't have to worry too much about the exact form. For now, I just want to first talk about the mean. So the way the mean is implemented is basically you have star formation rate versus time is the space that we actually observe. But you can integrate the uh, y-axis and get the cumulative star formation rate as a function of time. And so now this goes from zero at the Big Bang and 0% of the mass formed to 100% of the mass formed at the time of observation. And essentially, whenever you have constraints here, then that constraint with the Gaussian process passing through it can then be differentiated to get a curve in star formation history space. So, and then if you have uncertainties on that, then that directly translates to uncertainties on the star formation history as well. So if you have constraints like this, where you have for a given star formation history, you have T25 where it formed a quarter of its mass, T50 where it formed half, I don't know why that isn't showing up, or T75 where it it's formed three quarters of its mass, then putting that into the Gaussian process gives you a mean that looks something like that and closely tracks what the, uh, the underlying shape was. And the reason it does that is because like if T50 and T25 have a short time duration between them, they still have to form the same amount of mass. So the star formation rate had to have been higher during that interval. If you have just, and now this is the non-parametric part where you can now inform the number of these quantiles based on your data quality. So if you have just one, which would be T50, then that's what your star formation history looks like. It doesn't quite get it, but it roughly gets the overall characteristics. With two, it does slightly better. With three, it starts doing really well, where it gets both like the dip and then the rejuvenation. With five, it does even better. Now it starts getting subtleties. And as N goes to infinity, it converges back to the original or the underlying true star formation history. And that's partly why this is called the dense basis method because it's supposed to be as dense as the data needs it to be. <clears throat> okay, uh, just quickly showing even with one parameter, you can get a lot of flexibility in the shapes. And this is something that's important for people who are modeling galaxies because each of these shapes corresponds to a particular type of galaxy that we tend to think of. So it lets you model all of these uh, different galaxy populations without having to incorporate many different parametric forms. And this is a comparison with data from a simulation where it shows that it can still get the overall shape pretty well for many different galaxies that come out of these simulations. Huh, that's so weird. Oh, I think it's the small graphics that I had. 
alongside every point. Okay, so this is great. We can get star formation histories. We can model them according to the data quality. Where's the physics though? So coming back to this, we have all of these physical processes and we want to link this two features in the star formation history. And so coming back to this plot, th this is a record of star formation over time and when different things happen to a galaxy, when different physical processes act on a galaxy to shape its star formation, it should leave imprints here. One way of getting at that is through these overall long time scale behavior or what you can think of as phase information. And the other part is through uh, frequency domain information. So you can essentially break down the star formation history into fluctuations in the star formation rate acting on different time scales. So you have the long, intermediate and short time scales that again map to the physical processes that we talked about earlier. And now you can go into these cosmological simulations, which implement uh, essentially all the physics that we know to date of what galaxies form with constraints driven by computational power and resolution. And look at the power spectrum. So you essentially go to Fourier space, you take the star formation histories and you Fourier transform them to get the power spectral density and look at how that varies for galaxies of different stellar masses. And you can see that there are like some common trends in the PSDs and some notable differences. And again, like not all of these simulations are on an equal footing. Some of them have different resolutions. Some of them are semi-analytic, which means that they use an analytical prescription to turn dark matter halo merge, like merger trees into galaxy properties instead of actually doing the hydrodynamics of how the galaxies evolve. And so there are some notable differences as a result of like how these things are implemented. So the nice thing is, even though there are similar trends in the star formation histories, there are notable differences in the PSDs that might be sensitive to the way the physics is implemented in these different simulations. So you can essentially take a single simulation and you can see how the uh, strength of SFR fluctuations changes at different time scales and essentially make these plots at three different time scales and be like, okay, I can use this to construct a, a theory of what happens to a galaxy because of the physical processes acting on that time scale. Sorry, <coughs> something in my throat. All right, this was great. I was like, I can do this. I can now connect it to physics. Until as a sanity check, I decided to put all the other simulations on this plot. Right, this was the increasing mass trend. And that's what I got when I added all the other simulations. And so I'm like, okay, it's a bit harder to see the trend now. So I was initially put off by this and I went and fed some ducks in Central Park and I came back and thought about it a bit more and realized it's not actually bad because this tells us that the simulations are really sensitive to the input physics and that observational constraints in this space, in the power spectral density space, can actually constrain the relative strengths of all of these feedback processes because it makes such a big difference. So as a sanity check, I essentially went into a single simulation again, Illustris TNG, and looked at these small boxes where they change different things where they make the strength of stellar winds greater or smaller or when they turn the effect of supermassive black holes off and that does produce changes very similar to the kinds of changes that we see in these uh, different simulations so it might be a good starting point again well every time you see that slide you know it's a new section though <laughs> okay so that brings us to how we can actually constrain this uh, time scale or this fluctuation on a given time scale information, right? Like, because that seems to be a much harder problem than the overall shape of the star formation history. So again, three different time scales, spectral indicators that allow us to break degeneracies between those time scales to get at the star formation history. This is well and good, except when we look at ensembles of galaxies or a galaxy population, we can do more than just get the information for a single broad time scale event. We can actually use distributions of these different indicators and their covariances to understand something about the fluctuations at different time scales. And the way this works is again going back to the Gaussian process. Now we look at the covariance function. So this is something that we fixed when we were doing the mean earlier. 
but now we can go back and unfreeze this and see if we can use populations of galaxies to actually get some physical information about this covariance function. And so this is essentially us trying to build a two point function for star formation rate fluctuations correlated over time. So you can take a physical model like the one shown here, where gas comes in, uh, some of this gas is thrown out and falls back in. And then within the galaxy, there are clumps of dense gas that can form stars that are created and disrupted. And model that analytically to come up with a power spectrum for how all of this should look like. And then these powers, the power spectrum has uh, a strength that sets the overall level of stochasticity and time scales that tell you the essentially length scales or well, if you have gas inflows that has a particular length scale and that translates into a characteristic time scale. So it tells you how these things set the overall correlations within a galaxy star formation history. And then we can use the wiener kinchin theorem, which allows us to go from the power spectrum space to real space and turn this into an autocovariance function. And this is exactly of the same form that a Gaussian process takes as an input. So what we can now do equipped with this ACF is to forward model galaxy uh, star formation histories that have that particular covariance structure and forward model that into spectral space, into observable space, and then use this to actually build distributions of observables that we can use to constrain the characteristics of the underlying autocovariance function. So the way this works for a time for a, a toy example, you can take different kinds of galaxies like high redshift galaxies or Milky Way analogs, and you essentially say that like the high redshift galaxies have uh, like they're correlated over very short time scales or the Milky Way analogs are correlated over very long time scales, or the Milky Way analogs have less stochasticity compared to dwarf galaxies, which have a shallower potential well and therefore tend to be more bursty. So you can take these sort of like physical priors on what you think these galaxies have uh, regulating the star formation, put that in to the PSD forward model star formation histories that actually look very different from each other, right? Like so the Milky Way galaxies, because they're correlated over longer time scales, tend to be smoother. And because they have less stochasticity, they tend to be a lot less bursty. And then you can forward model that into spectra. And then you can extract the spectral features that I talked about and essentially plot them to see how different they are. So they tend to inhabit quite different parts of the observable parameter space. And so now if you go back and say, all right, so I have this machinery. Now, can I use this machinery to actually constrain the stochasticity, like the inflow time scale and all of that for a single galaxy? Turns out the answer is no, because a single galaxy just doesn't have that much information. But the nice thing is this is meant to be a population level analysis. So even with as little as 30 galaxies, you can build an inference framework that allows you to distinguish models of stochasticity and constrain the parameters that go into these models. So even for these small specialized samples of galaxies, you can now start constraining timescales and using that to understand more of what's going on in the physics. So this is getting us constraints on that power spectrum. Great, so we established that fluctuations matter. We looked at how we can constrain the fluctuations from uh, our observations. Now, how do we link that back to the physics, right? So Yunjin Shin, a student with Sandhya Takela, essentially looked at these idealized galaxy simulations where uh, you can change essentially the amount of energy exploding stars have or the amount of the stars that live in what's called the bulge or the central region of a galaxy. And notice that there are characteristic signatures in the power spectra that are associated with these changes. And so essentially there are these kinds of controlled simulations might be our way to, to actually go in and link what we see in the power spectra to actual physical pro processes. And now I'm currently working on a project. Uh, this one's like very much in the works, so please don't share this. But it essentially looks at uh, this massive set of simulations called camels, where you do a thousand runs of a cosmological volume uh, that essentially has like many galaxies in it. And you can vary both the cosmology and you can vary the, the feedback properties. So like the strength of 
exploding supernovae or feedback from supermassive black holes. And you can essentially train machine learning algorithms to then predict what the star formation histories are going to be as a function of uh, all of these different properties and, oops, and use that to create these curves of uh, how each parameter affects star formation within a galaxy. So this is how we finally link feedback to the physics of what's going on and regulating star formation in galaxies. All right, so to summarize, star formation histories and simulations depend sensitively on feedback. You can make models of how that's related to fluctuation timescales, and you can then constrain that using observations. And then you can run these bespoke simulations that vary feedback to essentially link what we see in the observations to the strength of these different uh, physical processes that are regulating star formation. All right. This was sort of the main trajectory of my current science, but star formation studies enable you to do so many things that I quickly wanted to just go over what some students and collaborators are up to. Uh, if any of this is interesting, just ask me questions about it. So the first thing you can do is because you can fit many galaxies, you can create maps of how star formation changes from very, uh, or I used to say very early epochs when Hubble was the only thing in the sky. And now it's moderately early epochs uh, from when galaxies were not very massive to when they were fully massive. And you can see how galaxies start out uh, actively forming stars and how they end up on average looking pretty quenched when they're massive. Uh, you can use this to, because you have star formation history information, anything that depends on the star formation history, like the stellar mass of a galaxy, which is how many stars it has, or the rate at which it's forming stars, uh, all also get better constrained once you have more robust star formation history information. So there was this offset between simulations and observations, and I think Erica had a paper in 2021 that sort of like resolved that, and now it's gone, and it's great. Things are no longer a debate of who's getting it wrong, whether it's the simulators or the observers. Uh, you can use star formation histories to think of galaxies not as static objects, but as things evolving over time. So you can essentially take what used to be individual points in stellar mass star formation rate and a certain redshift that we observe a galaxy as, and now augment that with history information to see how galaxy populations at different epochs are connected to each other. You can start correlating with this with ancillary observables and seeing how galaxies that look disky or look spheroidal or have had a recent interaction, do they have different looking star formation histories? And how's that related to, again, the common physics that's causing a change both in the morphology and in the history. You can look at galaxies that shut off star formation and then started forming stars again. This wasn't something that we could do with parametric models, but with non-parametric models, you see that almost 20% of galaxies can have this kind of behavior. You can break down a galaxy's lifetime into uh, different phases and see what fraction of its life did it spend in a starburst or uh, how, how much time has it been quenched for and things like that. Charlotte Olson, who's now a postdoc at CUNY, did this incredible analysis uh, comparing star formation histories using spectra, which is what we use at high redshifts to information from color magnitude diagrams, which we tend to have access to at low edges, we can actually resolve individual stars and found remarkable consistency between those two. Caleb Lammers is an incredible student at U of T who's, who, he was an undergrad when I started working with him. He's now a grad student at Princeton. Uh, looked at the effect of AGN feedback on uh, star formation histories and found that they tend to quench not faster, but earlier. And so that's something that we're still unpacking. No, this is not a new section. Oh, wait, can I? That's so weird. OK, well, I can just show this slide instead. Uh, Juan Alfonso is, again, was an undergrad when he started working with me. He's now a grad student in Japan. Uh, is looking at the link between morphology and uh, star formation histories and essentially finds that you can train a neural network to just predict the star formation history from an image of a galaxy instead of a spectrum 
and then go back and ask the neural network which part of the image did you look at to make a prediction. And so this is this incredible field of interpretable machine learning that's had so many fun results recently. Uh, Jinho Kim, who's working with Lamia and Josh uh, at Toronto, is trying to see if we can skip a lot of steps to go directly from galaxy um, spectra to their half mass sizes, uh, which essentially allows you to account for a whole bunch of systematics that are usually computationally expensive to, to model. Uh, Anika Zilowski is looking at these dimensionally reduced representations of galaxy images and trying to see if you can come up with new selection criteria for galaxies based on these kinds of reduced uh, information rich spaces. Kate Gould is looking at quenched galaxies at high redshift and using both Hubble data and now JWST data to figure out uh, if you can determine the earliest epoch at which galaxies can physically quench instead of just have low star formation rates. Uh, Eric Ludwig, at, uh, uh, who's a post back at uh, New York, is looking at these E plus A galaxies or what are sometimes called post Starburst galaxies and trying to see if they can form in simulations the same way they form, uh, or like if, if simulations are consistent with the observables that we see in low redshift, high signal to noise data, and then trying to see if they can form in physically consistent ways. And Guillaume uh, is a postdoc at St. Mary's who wrote this paper sort of reanalyzing some of the galaxies that Erica found. and. Uh, essentially seeing whether we find this in a separate field that's roughly the same area as the Sears field that the original galaxies were found in and finding that they're actually less of these very massive objects. So it could be a cosmic variance thing that's driving uh, some of the results there. And there's a whole bunch of other things where you can now, if now that you have ensembles of star formation histories, you can do really cool things like Look at morphological evolution, tie it together, uh, and do these systematic comparisons. So Kami Pachavici has this really cool comparison paper where she took 14 different SED fitting codes, so ways of getting physical properties from spectra uh, in 14 different ways. For, when we had a conference where all of these builders were at the same place and we were like, fit our data, and got them to run it and did this incredible comparison. Oh again. All right, so that's the formal end of my talk. This is something that's a bonus. Uh, I can stop here or we can take two minutes to look at this. What do people feel like? Are, are people saturated? Do we want to stop? Yes, no? Yeah, I, yeah, I can do two minutes to show this or we can do questions directly. All right, fine. So, how many people here have used ChatGPT? Okay, good fraction. So as these large language models started getting built, I turned that to try to answer this question of how do we keep track with the exploding literature that we have in both astronomy, but also machine learning and basically every other field as more and more people are writing more and more papers and it's becoming increasingly more difficult to read all the papers, let alone keep track of how it's changing. So I essentially made a tool that can ingest all of the papers and then answer questions based on that, give short, concise answers and cannot make up sources. So it has to link its answer to where it got its uh, information from. And this can either be single source papers, like this is a pretty easy question. So it needs only a single source, but also more complex questions where it needs to synthesize information from multiple sources. So here's one where uh, one of Erica's papers actually shows up as the top source uh, saying that like, oh yeah, there are these galaxies that JWST can see that SST could not. And then you can refine your question and like, what are their properties? And it'll try to give you that information as well. So this is based on this embedding that I made where every point here is a single, a single archive posting for an astronomy paper. And it essentially picks out the most relevant region and tries to build its answer using the papers in that region. And so that's the question that I just asked. And the points are basically the sources that it selected. 
And if you make a heat map of this, it looks a bit like a world map. You can see some areas with water, some areas with land. And so you can use another machine learning technique called stable diffusion to turn that into a map. <laughs> this is why it was a bonus. It's fun. Uh, and the nice thing about this is forests are the areas that are well studied. Grasslands are the areas that are sort of actively being developed. And water is where there are no papers currently. So straits essentially also show you parts where uh, you need to maybe bridge two parts of the current galaxy evolution field to try to get papers there. And so there's a QR code here if people want to play around with this tool, try answering questions. If it breaks, let me know because that's good feedback for me. Uh, I can put the QR code up later. But basically, you can now start labeling these things. So you have the forests of galaxy morphology, you have Aegean Island, which is its own thing over here. <laughs> And you have JWST Valley. It used to be water over there, and that's where papers are filling it up now. So that's why it's grasslands. So any new topic is going to be coastal, much like cities. All right, and that's sort of my journey through the space as I've been playing around with different parts of galaxy evolution. All right, uh, last, last thing, the Pansov ACD Forum is this place where people who work with galaxy spectra can come talk to each other. You can join it at this link. We, it's not been very active currently, but that's something we plan to change. All right, and we're done. We made it. <laughs> Sorry about going a bit over time. <laughs> um, if people need to leave, that's totally okay. I know we, but like, you know, the map of all archive papers, worth it, right? Um, okay, questions. Do people have questions? There's this nice little furry thing on the mic this time. Erica, this, this actually might be for you as well. Um, but <laughs> recently there was a paper in Nature Astronomy mm -hmm. that talked about biases in GWHT um, photometric redshifts. Mm -hmm. um, and they had sort of, they drew on a sort of a classical explanation, if I remember correctly, from, from Eddington. So what does that bias too, because everybody was shocked initially about how distant these galaxies are and star formation processes, AGNs and so forth. So where do you all think this is, this is going to go? I mean, that's a, it's a pretty broad question. Wait, do you want to go first? No, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first. Okay. So time. photometric redshifts have always been sort of our first step into interpreting what galaxies, where galaxies are and what they're doing. And biases there generally tend to come in two flavors. Like one is catastrophic failures, where something's either like a very high redshift uh, star forming object or a lower redshift dusty thing where like the dust obscures what's happening in the blue wavelengths. Or it tends to be subtler things like uh, essentially the region around the Lyman alpha break being smoother than we expect and that causing small systematic shifts. So to the extent of what I know, it's, I mean, we are still in the, in the regime where like we have a million galaxies, but we haven't processed all of them on the same footing. And we don't know how much cosmic variance and other things play into, into this. So, a lot of the early results are setting up questions that I think we'll spend the next few years answering. But beyond that, I don't know where it's going to go. It's not clear to me where the biases are coming from. Ah, okay. It's not clear to any of us where the biases are coming from. That's, you know. But they are systematic. Yeah, I mean, it's completely new data with completely new systematics. All the star formation histories are, you know, we don't, yep. we don't know them yet until Cardiac tells us them and that you know we don't know anything about the formation of these things so i think yeah you're right there's a lot for us to uncover questions more questions yes dave i think this was a this is a quick one about the gaussian processes that you mm -hmm. talked about you talked about as n increases towards infinity you can yep. get a better and better fit to your observations but every time you add a Gaussian, you're adding two or maybe even three parameters, depending upon if you have control over where that Gaussian ah, is centered. Right. So where is the sweet spot? I assume n equals one is bad, and I assume n equals infinity. You know, as you increase the number of parameters, of course you can fit the data. Right. So where is the sweet spot in the middle? 
So the other wrinkle before answering this question is that our observations are sort of roughly logarithmically sensitive to time, whereas all the staff mission street plots that I showed essentially had time as a linear axis. So the the sweet spot is also dependent dependent on like where the star formation actually happened, but uh, with Hubble data, when I'd done this analysis, it essentially found five to seven to be the sweet spot of what we could get with that photometric data set, and it really comes down to like signal to noise, what kind of galaxies, and like a bunch of other niggly factors about like wavelength coverage and other things. Thanks. Awesome. I know we're at the end of time. So let's give Kartik a hand one more time and we can take questions after.